Welcome back. So next I want to give you a little bit of a demo of uh, what Cognicrypt looks like, in this case in the Eclipse IDE. And um, yeah, let's say we are having this task, uh, or we are given this task of actually cryptograph uh, cryptographically uh, signing uh, a certain piece of data, like you see here. So we're given uh, string data as an input. And we already know that we need to use uh, the signature class, okay? And so we're creating a signature object using get instance here. And now we look into the tooltips and um, the suggestions and we see that update is probably a method that we should be calling. But now CopyCrypt already runs and tells you, oh, you actually forgot to initialize this object here. So you should have called init sign or init verify. And now we're actually calling this um, and uh, initializing the signature object here. And uh, this actually needs a private key. And um, then also we need to call uh, the sign method. <clears throat> and we do this here. And now Cognicrypt is actually happy. So it accepts uh, that particular implementation, but we still need to actually generate the private key. So this is done using a so-called key pair generator because you need a public and a private key. Um, so again, we are instantiating that particular object and we're providing some algorithm here. Let's just say for the sake of the example, we actually use AES at this point. Um, and then of course we want to generate a key pair. So let's do that. And now from the key pair, we actually extract the private key and we return this. Sounds sensible, right? Now Cognicrypt has already run again and it's telling us a number of other error messages. Let's take a look at this one. This is actually telling us that the key that is used up there, it's not properly generated. So there's something wrong down there. And it's complaining here that we chose AES where it really should have been RSA instead, okay? And now here it's telling us that we again forgot to initialize this object because uh, we actually need to tell the key pair generator what the key size is. So uh, let's tell it the key size. Hmm, Cognicrypt is still not happy. What is it telling us now? Oh, it should be a different key size. Key size, for instance, 1024. And now we store this and again, it's happy. Okay, and this would now be, uh, at least back at the time when we recorded this video, uh, it was a securely, uh, well, a secure configuration that uh, we consider to be secure. There are now actually recommendations that you should be using larger key sizes even for RSA, uh, but this is something that can be easily updated by just changing uh, a single line in the quiz specification. And in fact, we uh, have uh, just had a, uh, student thesis uh, a few months ago where we uh, looked into um, implementing a service that would keep these things up to date for you automatically. But uh, what I wanted to show you here is that the interaction with Cognicrypt is really rapid, right? So uh, the code is being checked and rechecked as you type. It's almost uh, like a spell checker really. And um, because we have a demand-driven analysis here, it uh, almost doesn't matter at all whether uh, this is really a single example class uh, that we use or whether this is part of a larger project because um, like I explained previously due to the demand drivenness of the algorithms we immediately focus on the code that matters to the analysis so here we immediately focus uh, on the code that actually uses these crypto APIs and uh, we ignore everything else right and that makes the analysis really rapid. So what kind of misuses can Cognicrypt find? Well, basically everything that is uh, defined through the uh, quizzes specifications, right, or as deviations from these specifications, in particular, incorrect calling sequences, insecure choices of parameters, and also insecure compositions of um, objects like I just showed you, for instance, where we had um, insecurely generated key for the signature object. That's how Cognicrypt uh, works from the user perspective and what it looks like. On the next few slides, I want to show you how we actually do this in terms of the actual static analysis. And um, 
as I already told you briefly, it's basically a just-in-time demand-driven analysis. And um, as a first step, the analysis really um, identifies starting points. So, um, for instance, um, I showed you that we have this specification here for the signature class um, that actually names um, uh, get instance methods like uh, I'm showing you here, right? So um, that's what the quiz specification would look like for that particular class. And um, because we named get instance here, we know that signature.getInstance is actually an event that is relevant to that specification. And so we do a simple, uh, you know, syntactic search, which is linear in the size of the program, to identify the relevant call sites. And all we need to do this is a call graph, right? So a simple call graph analysis is already sufficient for this. Um, then, this way we have identified these call sites of interest, okay? Then secondly, we implement a type state analysis um, that moves forward from these uh, particular uh, call sites. So these basically become the starting points of a demand-driven forward type state analysis that we conduct. And um, what does the type state analysis do? It basically um, checks whether the calling sequence that we have here, so based on these events that you see here, right, these are all uh, calls on the same signature object, and these are all calls on the same uh, key pair generator object. Uh, so it checks that these calls adhere to the respective regular expressions or the um, finite state machines that these regular expressions induce, um, you know, taken from the respective specifications. So here in this case, two different specifications would be involved, the one for signature, the one for key pair generator, so you, you would essentially have, um, at analysis time, uh, two different finite state machines. And here we check the statement sequence uh, for one of these and here for the others. And of course, um, the code here looks all nice and concise and compact and it's all you know, within one procedure and um, it's all even uh, one statement after the other. Um, but the way it's implemented in CogniCrypt, it's actually using synchronized pushdown systems. So uh, we have a fully field and context sensitive analysis. So this means all of these statements, they could be spread apart through different procedures. And if they are, we do a context sensitive analysis uh, throughout the different classes. But it's still fairly efficient because, um, like I said, we only focus on the part of the program that matters. And it's all um, demand driven. So the initial search in step one is really entirely syntactic and it's linear in the size of the program. And step two is then demand driven. So it's initiated at every statement and for every value that uh, step one matches. And then actually within the second step, any aliasing um, is automatically resolved through recursive backward queries computed with Boomerang. Right? So this I already explained to you. Um, whenever there is an assignment to a heap variable, to a heap object, um, this uh, boomerang query is uh, triggered, so we do a backward analysis followed by a forward um, uh, alias analysis, and then the results of this are incorporated back into the type state analysis um, so that it can propagate the type state onto any aliases as well. And uh, this is all implemented as a synchronized pushdown system. So what would this uh, look like um, for such a signature object, right? So um, if we have the type state analysis, for instance, it would start observing um, that you have a get instance call, for instance. So you have some um, state. So here the object has been constructed. Um, then you probably see a call to init sign. So you know now that it has been properly initialized with a private key. Um, then you may see a call to update. So you know that the data uh, has been updated, uh, so some signature data has been generated. You may see this repeatedly. So um, in this regular expression for signature, you will actually see that there's a, a star, right, to um, make sure that update can be called repeatedly. Um, and then in the end, if we see also a call to sign, we will know that the object is now in an accepting state, right, so the signature has been computed. 
Um, and we really have to be in such an accepting state in the end. So if you have an incomplete calling sequence, um, for instance, you forgot to call also a method in the end, um, then Cognicook will also flag this. But also, if you have um, such a premature call here, for instance, you might accidentally call sign without actually even ever having called update. So basically, you're trying to create a signature for nothing, right? <laughs> um, you, you haven't really processed any data. Um, then Cognicrypt, just by comparing this to its uh, internal state machine, will figure this out and warn you. Now, you may think that um, you know any deviations from the norm that, with respect to the calling sequence, it's rather a functional problem and it's maybe not so much a security problem. And in, in many cases, you may be right. So in many cases uh, where you deviate here, your code will simply not work correctly, right? Or you might even get a runtime exception if you were to try to run this code. Um, so it's not even functionally correct. But there are situations uh, where the code could appear functionally correct, um, but it's actually insecure because of such um, deviations. For instance, um, if you also are looking into um, PBE key spec, you will see that there is a particular method that you ought to call to actually clear the key that is kept in memory for the key spec. So that's a little bit similar to what I told you earlier about strings and arrays. So PBE key spec has an internal representation of the key and you are supposed to clear this uh, from memory when you don't use it any longer. Um, and if you forget to clear this, um, then this uh, is actually a potential security problem. So this is something that should be flagged only for security reasons, right? So it's, it's functional code if you don't clear it, but it's insecure code if you do so. Yeah. So um, going on with the analysis, so let's assume that we have already conducted now uh, the type state analysis, and this is really how it works in Cognicrypt. So we do a type state analysis first, and then we do actually a constraint analysis. And so, um, next, we try to determine these uh, string and, and maybe also integer expressions that we have here. And in this case, it's simple, right? Um, so the strings are directly as constants at the same statement, like you see here and here and here. But that's not necessarily always the case, right? So um, these strings, they might be um, constructed using a string concatenation and so on. Maybe also the integer might be computed in some case. And if there are simple computations and constructions, then um, Cognicrypt would actually do a demand-driven backward analysis here to try to um, figure out what kind of string has been constructed here nonetheless. So at the very least, we do constant propagation. Um, but um, yeah, there might also be cases where um, the string is actually loaded from an external data source, right? And um, for instance, we've talked to people at Oracle, and for them, that was actually the case. And then um, Cognicrypt will slowly reach its limits, right? So if there is an, an unknown file format that we cannot recognize and you know, the string is loaded from it, um, then Cognicrypt won't really know what that string is. And in this case, it will flag it for you nonetheless. So it will tell you that it's an unknown string and it can't really you know, know whether it's secure or not. And then it's um, up to you to actually uh, deal with this, for instance, by explicitly suppressing that warning. But in general, these strings, once we have computed them, if we have computed them, we uh, actually compare them uh, using the strings that are given in the individual specifications, as you can imagine. And this is really a simple you know, uh, character by character comparison. And um, what you might find interesting is um, in uh, the case uh, that we have here, we actually use boomerang to find these strings. So um, that's something you can also uh, do if you are in a similar situation. So boomerang, um, in addition to the aliases, it also returns to you the allocation sites of objects, right? And um, for constant strings that have been assigned to a variable, um, then the uh, string constant itself actually constitutes that allocation site. And so we can simply capture it using boomerang queries and then we can read off the string that we are interested in. The same 
in this particular case actually also works for integers because we have extended boomerang um, to track integers as well. Then in the end, um, we do uh, this constraint analysis, right? So um, we have these uh, constants, like I said, that can often be easily um, identified. Um, and for the other cases, we do a demand-driven backward analysis um, that takes care of simple string operations. Um, however, there's one underlying assumption that we do have for Cognicrypt. So uh, Cognicrypt is a tool meant to support developers and we do assume that they cooperate, right? So we not we don't assume that there are any evasive or malicious developers that are really trying to, you know, just bypass the security checks of the tools. Um, such situations can exist. So, for instance, let's say um, Google would be running CogniCrypt in its app store in order to to check whether people are using crypto correctly, and then there might be some developer who simply doesn't care or doesn't want to care, who has strict deadlines and you know just wants to do some weird string operations to just get around these checks. Um, yeah, then maybe this is not the right tool for them, right? So here we are really assuming that we have cooperative developers and the tool Cognicrypt has been uh, customized or set up in such a way that uh, it gives you best results for this scenario. And yeah, like I said, aliasing is resolved through boomerang queries. Then um, the final analysis that we conduct is actually a, a taint analysis problem. So um, this has to do with the uh, predicates. So um, I was telling you um, that we um, have these insurers and required clauses, right? And so for instance, here, um, we uh, assume that we have a key pair generator um, that has been generated securely, right? And then um, we had this uh, clause that I showed you here that we want to um, put this predicate generated key or securely generated key onto this key object, basically, right? And this is what's happening here. Um, so um, basically we are um, tracking the key pair here in this case and then the key that gets out of this. And um, this way we the analysis can figure out that the return value here that is being returned at this point will actually need this particular generated key um, predicate, okay? And then the predicate itself, it uh, is propagated up here. And so it can basically be consumed at this method call, right? So um, in the uh, specification for the signature class, we basically had this uh, clause that said, okay, we require that the key here is a generated key, and um, this can then also be um, checked at this point up here. All right. So the predicate analysis um, is actually implemented as follows. So first we considered using actually um, sort of a declarative language such as prolog or data log um, to analyze these predicates because you can see them as logical constraints. But eventually we actually implemented our own little constraints solver because we saw that this was actually simple enough to do and it was uh, more efficient and we didn't need the full expressive power of prolog or data log. Yeah, and that is already the uh, full analysis implementation, right? So we have the type state analysis uh, with the integrated boomerang queries for, for alias analysis um, and uh, it's all demand driven and then we have um, the constraint analysis and then in the end we uh, really have the taint analysis to keep track of these um, yeah of these uh, insurer guarantee of this insurer guarantee reasoning so these um, um, yeah uh, clauses that we generate there at this point now in a final video, um, I want to also talk about experiments that we did and about the empirical results that we obtained. So uh, stay tuned for more.